Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, I'm minded to support the bill at second reading because, like my honourable friend for Holborn and St Pancras, I respect the overall referendum outcome, even though I campaigned for a different result. And I believe the government is entitled to commence the leave negotiations by the 31st of March, but that we are entitled to some assurances about their intentions and the way they plan to proceed. I don't think the limited time allowed for the bill is right, and it would, it would be possible to allow more time and still meet the government's deadline. The impression the Prime Minister and her ministers have given since she assumed power is that they want to silence MPs and sideline Parliament and rely solely on their interpretation of the referendum result. Increasingly, it looks as if that means ignoring the views of the 48% who voted Remain, and even a large number of those who voted Leave when it comes to issues like the single market. I heard the Honourable Member for South East Cornwall say in an earlier intervention in the debate that it's only a two-clause bill and she didn't understand the need for a white paper. But I ask, is it sensible to embark on an epic journey without some idea of where we'll end up or how we'll get there? So it's one thing to give approval to start the negotiations, but something else to wash our hands <laughs> of constituents' concerns and give the government a free hand to do just as they please. I will give way. Does the Honourable Gentleman not acknowledge that the Prime Minister has already promised to issue that white paper at the earliest opportunity? Seven months she has. Well, I acknowledge uh, that after uh, a lifetime of denial, she then said that she would uh, issue one, and we might now get it after we've had the vote and the bill. Doesn't seem much use to me, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, the referendum, as has been pointed out, settled the question about our wish to leave the EU, but it didn't shape the answer. When the Prime Minister eventually broke her silence in the Lancaster House speech to reveal her intention to disengage entirely from the single market, I don't accept she was reflecting the views of a majority of people in this country. We need to try and ensure continued access to that market on the best terms we can secure, and one, I think, that doesn't exclude us from regulatory decisions, because without doing that, we are risking jobs and businesses and setting in train a period of uncertainty that may do untold damage to our economy. I accept that the Prime Minister's position is influenced by her desire to end freedom of movement. But where is the evidence that all those voting leave actually want to prioritise their concerns about freedom of movement against access to the market for our goods yeah, and yeah, services? Yeah. Why is it unreasonable to try and reach agreement on controls on freedom of movement? Why is it so wrong to seek fair movement arrangements, as my honourable friend for Wolverhampton North East suggested, arrangements that allow for those we need to come here and work while placing restrictions on lower skilled labour and those not in demand? Perhaps one way of helping that process would be if the government were to indicate as a positive gesture that we are not going to use the rights of EU citizens already living and working yeah, here yeah. as a bargaining chip. Yeah, yeah. It would not actually be a massive concession, as the Home Office has already calculated that 80 per cent of EU migrants living here after 2019 will be entitled to permanent residency. Yeah, I'll give way. Thank the Honourable General for giving way, and he makes a very good point about protecting the rights uh, of EU citizens who are contributing to this country and are living here. But when he makes the point about bargaining chip, would he also accept that actually it's the uh, other countries in the European Union who, who are potentially using this issue as a bargaining chip rather than this government? Uh, and it's very difficult to enter into negotiations uh, unless we have a similar agreement on their side to protect the rights of British citizens living elsewhere in Europe. Well, one way to start a negotiation is to offer up a gesture of goodwill. That's what I'm proposing in this situation. 
Uh, and, and it seems to me that we're actually talking about people who are mostly engaged in crucial jobs which help support and secure the jobs of many other British citizens. They were told that the referendum was a decisive result, but of course it couldn't have been much closer and there are many parts of the UK and indeed England that didn't vote to leave. My own constituency voted by a majority of just over 2,000 to remain. But if I break that down further, two of four wards voted to remain and two voted to leave. I have no intention of speaking up only for the views of one group and ignoring the feelings and opinions of the others. Rather helpfully, I carried out quite an extensive survey of my constituents in Selly Oak following the referendum because of the closeness of the result and my wish to better understand what people were telling me. 64% said they want the UK to continue to trade our goods and services within the single market. 76% think that we should commit to giving EU citizens already living and working here the right to remain. And people made clear their concerns about the cost of living, research funds and training programmes, employment and job security. We can't simply leave these things to chance. We need to know the government's approach and hence the importance of the White Paper. How are we to proceed when we have three strands, administrative, legal and trade, Will we try to deal with them all at once or sequentially? Will there be parallel WTO negotiations and talks with other countries? Who are our negotiators? Exactly how many do we have? Do we have the capacity for so many complex negotiations in so short a time? Do we have enough experts? <laughs> I, oh, he's left. I was going to say, I know that walks out somewhere. Do we have enough experts at our disposal? <laughs> we need to know what real progress is being made on the bright new world that enthusiastic Brexiteers are promising. I want to be optimistic about our future, and I was slightly encouraged to that effect by elements of government thinking in the recent Green Paper, building our industrial strategy. But I don't feel sufficiently optimistic to want to trust our future to those who lied their way through the referendum making promises of extra money for our health service that they have no intention of honouring. It's for these reasons that this House needs the Labour amendments with regular feedback on the shape and progress of the, these negotiations, a right to intervene on the final offer and a right to reject that offer if it's plainly against the interests of the vast majority of our constituents. Yeah, yeah.